Good morning. Happy Sabbath. If we could tell the people out in the uh, hallway to take it down a notch, because we're going to begin our service. Uh, the lady who's supposed to be here to do the welcome, she's not here, but I know I don't look like Whitney, but I'm Bob. <laughs> if you would, someone would find Heather Thorward, because we're going to have the kids connection after the opening hymn before the special music. But right now, as we start the service, I'd like everyone to stand up and say hi, and then we will begin our service. And there's a lady by the name of Marie Young. Is that right, Carolyn? Yeah. She passed away two days ago. So if any of you know her, let's pray for the family and uh, think about that and take a look at your bulletin, the things that we're getting ready for, is the prison meeting, I can't remember the date, but folks will be going to that to serve the prisoners. And we're so happy to see our pastor back. Would you stand up and let everybody see it? Look at this, he's back, praise the Lord. We, we have missed him so much and you've been in our prayers. Now everybody say hi to everybody, get up, say hi. It's a happy, beautiful day, that's it, give a hug. That's it. You all look good. Yes, okay. All right. So as we finish our announcements, there is a, a second reading, a membership transfer for Joanne and Martin Lone or Loney. They request transfer to the Eastwood SCA Church. I don't know why they want to leave us, but they, I guess they have a good reason. But uh, anyway, do we have to, Pastor, do we have to have a motion? To leave? So would someone give us a motion that they may leave? And second, please. Okay, it's so carried. So they will be going over to the Eastwood Church, and uh, we wish them well. So now let's stand, and our opening hymn is Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior, hymn 569. Everyone with me. with me. Second stand this. Come on, ladies. Everyone now.
men only now. Trusting only in thy merit, would I seek thy face? Heal my wounded, broken spirit, save me by thy grace. Save Sabbath for all the people that can be here and Lord it's wonderful to see our pastor back we know that he's been so through so much with the death of his mom console him and the rest of the family and thank you for allowing us to be able to hear his voice again it's a far peace between here and his home and to keep him in the air with safety bless all those who are in still digging out from the storms and the earthquakes and tsunami in some far place. Lord, we know that you're with everyone that's going through this. And here we stand in the comfort of this place. But we praise your holy name because you take care of us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I just saw Heather run back out the door because we were ready for her for the kids' connection. You're going to fill in? Okay. Now give me a, a break before I have to sing. Thank you so much, sir. Good to see you. You guys got to come up and get some buckets first. Is that right? Okay. Oh, at the buckets at the end. Okay. So glad you're here. Hi, guys. Am I only going to have two? Heather told me I usually had 60 kids up here. Was she fooling me? It takes them a minute to get here. We have a story this morning that's got to do with raspberries. Have any of you ever had a raspberry? Nope, you've never had a raspberry? They're the same color as strawberries, but they're better. You've had a raspberry? When did you have a raspberry? It's been a while, huh? Well, this is sort of a story about raspberries and lost sheep. Did you ever think that you can have a story about raspberries and lost sheep going together? But we'll see. Heather was going to help us this help Heather help us this morning, but I don't know. Did anybody see Miss Thorward this morning? Oh no, 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 no! Please don't. <laughs> Not yet. So, yeah. Well, you know, one time Miss Thorward, when she was our little girl, we just called her Heather. And one morning we got up. And everybody was busy around our little neighborhood. And we were watching the kids play in the cul-de-sac. And all of a sudden, we couldn't find Heather. And so I went over to Heather's mom and I said, Mom, have you seen Heather? What did you say? 
Well, she wasn't around. Well, we went looking, and, and, and we saw Danny playing out in the cul-de-sac. Dan, have you seen Heather? No. No. <laughs> we hadn't seen Heather. She was only about five years old, and, and we couldn't find her. So we ran out. We started asking the neighbors. And, and I need you guys to go down this aisle here. And will you ask people if they've seen Heather in the last couple minutes? We've got to see if we can find her. So, yeah. DJ, you know, some of you guys, will you help me? Just go down and ask some of these people if they've seen Heather. And I need some of you guys. Will you come down this aisle? And, and just come down. Let's ask them. Let's see if we can find Heather. Because she's only five years old, and we've got to find her. Have you guys seen Heather? No. Has Heather been playing in your yard? No. Where? Dr. Shuin, she loves you. I've not seen her. You have not seen her. What are we going to do? Have you guys, you guys seen Heather? I haven't seen her. No. What happened to Heather? I don't know. Do you think, you think maybe she's up there by the flags? Come on, come on, kids. Let's all go up and see if we can find her by the flags. Maybe she's up there. My goodness. I've never lost a daughter before, but we cannot find her anywhere. Do you guys see her up here by the flag, kids? Not Let's see me. if we can find her up here. You don't see her? So have any of you, did you find Heather? No. No? Did you find her in the back? No. Okay, kids, come up and tell me if you all found Heather. Did you all find Heather? Well, let's, let's come down here and let's think about what we can do. We were about at the point where I thought, man, what are we going to do? I think we better call the police and the sheriff's department. But Mama, Heather's mother, said, you know, I remember a story in the Bible. I remember a story about the lost sheep. And in the lost sheep... In Luke chapter 15, it says, Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and lost one. Wouldn't you leave 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that you'd lost? And when found, you can be sure you would put it across your shoulders rejoicing when you got home, calling your friends and neighbors and say, Celebrate with me. I found my lost sheep. So we're going to do what Mama suggested. Will you pray with me? Close your eyes. And we're going to pray really hard to see maybe if God will help us find Heather. Heavenly Father, we're missing Heather this morning. And we want so badly to find her. We know that you love her just like you love all the other little children. And, and if she would just come in and let us know that she's safe, we're going to have to call the police and the sheriff's department to try to find her. And we don't know where she is. So please, Lord, if you can... Please, please send in Heather. Let's look up. Does anybody see Heather? Hey. Heather! What are you guys doing? Where, where have you been? I've been eating, oh, okay. I've been eating raspberries. Yeah, ra raspberries. I had raspberries at the, at the uh, Worthington Farmer's Market. Well, my goodness. Very good. My goodness. Good she had gone and gotten raspberries in our backyard, and she was hidden in the middle of the bushes. And when we prayed, she came walking around just like that and said, hi, guys. <laughs> so remember, we love each other very much. Our parents love us, and Jesus loves us. So always make sure they know where you are. And when you can't find somebody you love, ask Jesus to help you, and they may walk in just as our Miss Heather did this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.
base up on just what I've seen. I think if we uh, had raspberries for the kids, they would run down both aisles, wouldn't they? <laughs> nothing like a good raspberry and I'm glad they found Heather. As I said before, I'm so happy to see the pastor back and I know that you are too. And <clears throat> I didn't know what to sing this morning, but I picked a remake of an old hymn and there's one part of it that uh, moves along so you might want to pat, pat your feet and you're allowed to do that if you want. Okay? Grandma singing sweet by and by Wasn't the sweetest sounding thing But some about ways Grandma sang with Move your feet, sir Something up inside See her grin from here to here One could see so very clear It wasn't just a song It was her life In the sweet spirit and uh, 
cheerful songs. Friends, for those of you who by chance may not know me, uh, I am uh, Pastor Julian, and I have the privilege to serve here in the Worthington Seventh Day Adventist Church as the lead pastor of this wonderful congregation. And today here, before I uh, share with you the Word of God, I would like to tell you that I love my church, the Worthington Seventh Day Adventist Church, and I do love my church not because I am the pastor here, but I'm all, because I'm also a member here. Amen. And because this is my church family. Amen. Uh, for those of you who may not know, uh, this summer has been an emotional roller coaster for my family and I. This summer we had the privilege uh, to see our daughter married. And while, while we were celebrating, we were also praying for my mom because she was going through a very rough time. And as my mom put it, please pray for me that I do not mess up the wedding of my granddaughter. And by that mean, she meant that I will not die at the same time. And then uh, after the wedding of our daughter, I had to fly together with my wife because my sister was telling me, you have to come right away here. And my mom stabilized for a while. God listened to our prayers. And then we came back. And two weeks later, one early morning on September 12th, which was 12 o'clock in Bulgaria, I received a message that my mom just passed away. And this is where you come as a church family. I love my church family because they know how to love. And my Savior has told me that by this you will know my disciples. And how does it go? By this you should know them because they have the right doctrines. Is this what Jesus said? No. By this you should know my disciples that they love as I love. So I'm here today to thank you, friends, for being my family. During this time, we receive countless cards congratulating us on the marriage of our daughter, countless cards grieving together with us as we were going through the loss of my mom. And it felt like the, both the joys were multiplied and the griefs lessened because I, was, I, knew, I knew I was not grieving alone. I knew that my family is grieving with me. So thank you for being my family. And I know you have been uh, like that not just toward me, but toward many who have come through the doors of this church. And if somehow by chance we have dropped the ball on you, on some of you, I just want, want you to know that you just caught us in a moment when we have been human. But this is not the church that I belong to. Here we love people. And I just wanted to share with you a few of the pictures in which you have been part. Without soliciting it, you, the warning of the Seventh Day Adventist Church, threw a big uh, wedding shower for our daughter. And you helped us with, uh, even with uh, a little bit with the costs of uh, her wedding. And this is our daughter, Laura happily married to our son-in-law, Alex. And I would like to thank those of you who were able to be part of her wedding celebration, even though it was not here in Columbus as we wanted it. For some reason, Alex and uh, Laura decided to do it in Chicago. And I would like to thank you for being part of that, too. I wanted to show you a few pictures of my mom long before even I knew her, long before you knew her. 
In the, verse, the very first picture is uh, the youngest picture of my mom that I have found. She's a teenager here, probably very early teens. And next to it is uh, her picture as a, a high school student. And this is my mom and dad at the time they got married, right in their late teens, early 20s. And here, my mom, my sister, and I, one year before the passing away of my dad. And here, I would like to also remind you of the time when my mom was here in Worthington. And just by the hat she's wearing, you can guess what time of the year that was. <laughs> this was the Sabbath, right when we were announcing that uh, the week after, our church, as usual, every year, opens wide the doors for those people who do not have a family, who do not have anyone to celebrate Thanksgiving with. And many of you show up on Thanksgiving Day. Before you eat dinner with your families, you show up here in the church and serve 100 to 150 people from the homeless community or from the people who do not have family to celebrate with. So this is my church. And this is the last picture of my mom and I. So, on behalf of my wife and I, thank you for being our church family. Thank you for loving us. Keep the good work and let everybody who walks through these doors feel the love and feel the vibe of a true family of God. Thank you. Now I'd like to ask the team upstairs to dim the lights. We're gonna to transition to the sermon. And for those of you who are new here, I would like to introduce the topic of our overall team. Heavenly Father, we are about to open your divine word and we are about to let your spirit teach us. Please give us pliable hearts and teachable spirits and speak to us through your divine word. Help me to deliver it to your people unadulterated by human ideas and human ambitions and let your voice be heard and let your voice transform the lives of all those who listen. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray and all the people of God said together, Amen. Last time we started the story of Jacob wrestling with the angel of God, or should I say, wrestling with the angel who is God. The day had arrived for Jake 
the day that he dreaded for 20 years, the day to meet his brother Esau. And every single time we have to face challenges, circumstances of life, whether we notice it or unbeknownst to us, God comes to us. And that night, God came to meet Jacob. That night, God met Jake in a wrestling match. The grace of God pinned down Jacob to the ground. The grace of God pinned him down till he surrendered everything to God. His ambitions, his pride, his desire to bless himself on the expense of others, that night God pinned down Jake till he surrendered everything. And sometimes we get pinned down to the ground by the grace of God too. Oftentimes God comes to us through illnesses and bankruptcies, through divorces and the loss of a loved one. And he pins us down to the ground because oftentimes these are the only times he can bring us down on our knees and change us. During the last two years, I have asked God again and again, why did he allow my mom to be pinned down by this horrible disease called cancer? And God seemed silent. Until I suddenly got a powerful inkling as to why God may have pinned down my mom with this horrible disease to the ground. During the last few weeks of the life of my mom, I saw something I've never seen in her before. Those few of you who know my mom know that my mom is hopelessly independent, has this strong will, iron will, has this stubborn personality that is almost painful to deal with. But all of that was miraculously gone during the last three weeks of her life. During the last weeks of her life, I saw her subdued, pliable, able to talk to, to reason with, as I have never seen her in my life. Similarly, God pinned down Jake on the night before he met with uh, Esau. And the grace of God made him pliable and subdued, willing to change like never before. Friends, today I would like to talk to you about a very important topic of a Christian life. Today I would like to talk to you about reconciliation, and in particular about the price of reconciliation. Would you please help me out and take out of uh, the pews, the Bibles, take your electronic devices. I hope you have installed not just the Facebook app, 
but an app that has, that has the book. So browse to your electronic devices, flip the pages of your Bible, and let's get to Genesis chapter 33. Genesis 33, verses 1 through 7. And I would like to invite someone to do me the favor, lift up her or his hand, and volunteer to read for us. And uh, uh, Rafael Zonian is going to come to you with a microphone. We have uh, Tori volunteering to read. Thank you, Tori. Rafi is going to be there momentarily, speeding up his uh, walk. And we're going to hear your voice. Jacob looked up, and there was Esau coming with his four hundred men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. He himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother, but Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Then Esau looked up and saw the women and children. Who are these with you? He asked. Jacob answered, They are the children of God. Oh, they are the children God has graciously given your servant. Then the female servants and their children approached and bowed down. Next, Leah and her children came and bowed down. The last of them all came, Joseph and Rachel, and they too bowed down. Thank you, Dory. As Jacob stood towering and swaying, crippled by the grace of God that early morning under the rays of the rising sun. He lifted up his eyes and he saw his brother Esau coming with a small army of 400 men. And it looked that the whole night of wrestling with God and praying has changed nothing of his circumstances because Esau's army has not gotten any smaller and seemingly God has not answered his prayer. The only thing Esau had accomplished was a dislocated hip. Jake lifted up his eyes and when he assessed the situation, he sprang to action. Though exhausted, he called his wives and his children. And the Bible tells us that he put in the front the maid servants and their children. In the second group, he put Leah and her children. And in the very rear, in the safest place possible, he placed Rachel and her young son, Joseph. Jake arranged his wives and their children in the order of their importance to him. This was the order of the love priorities of Jake. From the least loved to the most important in his life. And I would like to tell you something about the crisis or crisis of life. The crisis of life reveal our love priorities. But not just to us. The crisis of, law, of life reveal our priorities to our children and grandchildren as well. How it must have hurt 
the family of Jacob, to see which one Jacob thought are the expendable ones. But I would like to get back to Jake. Because one thing has happened that night. One thing has happened that night. Jacob was not a coward anymore. Because the Bible tells us that hobbling and limping, Jake ran ahead of all these three groups of women and children and stood up in the front to face what he assumed angry Esau. And the Bible tells us that he, in Hebrew when you read it, he prostrated himself on the face, on the ground. How many times? As he was approaching Esau, he gave him this homage and honor of a pharaoh. Seven prostrations were not just given to the highest of dignities in the ancient world. Seven prostrations were a symbol of a complete humility and submission to someone. And here is the first price tag of reconciliation. Reconciliation is impossible without the perfect humility and a spirit of submission. Without the perfect humility and a spirit of, sub uh, of submission. It is impossible to reconcile. And I know some of you sitting here in this pews have a person or two or maybe a dozen you need to reconcile with. And you stubbornly refuse. And you have thousands of reasons to not reconcile. I would like just to tell you why you cannot reconcile. Because only those who have faced God and have wrestled with Him can reconcile. Until we meet God and we wrestle with Him, we cannot reconcile with anyone. And I'm sorry to offend you, but chances are if you stubbornly refuse to humble yourself and to reconcile, you have not met God. The nature of Jake's prevailing with God, as the Bible says, as he was wrestling with God, was simply that he held on to God as God was weakening him and was dislocating his life and his joints. The prevailing of Jake was to hang up on God when God was pinning him to the ground. And to hold on God in perfect submission of his will. Jake clung unto God in this painful humbling that God was putting him through until he came so low that God was able to pick him up and raise him to the place where he belonged. Jacob's strength, paradoxically, was his weakness. And I have no idea in what way God has pinned you down. It may be a disease, it may be a, f a family that is crumbling down in conflicts. It may be financial shambles you find yourself in. It may be the crumbling of your relationships on all sides. 
I have no idea how God is pinning you down, but you know it. Would you let your weakness become your strength? Would you let go of your pride? Would you let go of your stubborn desire to run your life your way? And let him lift you up. By the way, let me go back to the bowing of Jacob. How many times did he bow down? How many? Accidentally. Do you know how many times, how many blessings did Jake steal from his father and from his brother? How many blessings did uh, Isaac pronounce on Jake? Take a guess. Give me a number. How did you know? <laughs> because when you read Genesis 27 verses uh, 28 and 29, Isaac pronounced exactly seven blessings. There were seven blessings that Jake stole from his brother Esau. But in the middle of these seven blessings, there were two that actually made the, the blood of his brother Esau boil. Here they on the screen. Be master over your brothers and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Now, remind me again, here Esau and Jacob are meeting. Who is bowing down? Who is bowing down? Why? Wasn't he blessed? with a blessing that his brother is going to bow down? Why is Jake bowing down? The bowing down of Jacob is an exact reverse reversal of the central blessing of his father. Because Jake wanted to convey loud and clear the message to his brother. Jacob's reversal of the blessing was telling his brother Esau, I'm sorry my brother. Here I'm restoring your stolen dignity. Because friends, every single time we offend someone, we are not just hurting him emotionally or spiritually or maybe even physically. We are stealing always his or her dignity. And here is price tag number two of true reconciliation. True reconciliation is impossible without the restoration of human dignity. And by prostrating himself seven times, and I, I don't know if you've read the whole chapter, but it is numerous times that Jacob says repeatedly, I am your servant and you are my master. He does not call his brother one time, brother Esau. He calls him master. Trying to convey this idea again and again and again. I am restoring to you the stolen dignity. As a matter of fact, it is very probable that at least several of these 400 soldiers that were marching together with Esau were some of his youthful comrades who witnessed his dignity being stolen away. And maybe sometimes they made even fun of Esau's stupidity. How can you let your little brother steal your dignity like that. So next time you want to reconcile, remember to restore the stolen dignity. 
Otherwise, there will never be true reconciliation. And then suddenly, after Esau witnessing the seven prostrations of his brother, after he receives the message, after he has been called numerous times master by his brother, the Bible tells us that Esau ran. But Esau ran not to stab his brother with a dagger and to pay off for the stolen dignity. The Bible tells us that Esau ran to meet him, to embrace him, to fall on his neck, to kiss him, and to weep together. That's an amazing scene, friends. And I'm sure Esau's husky soldiers and Jacob's frightened camp couldn't comprehend what just happened. No one could make sense out of this sudden change of attitudes. However, God could make a sense of it. For God is a God of who mends broken relationships. If God is interested in, in anything, it is in mending broken human hearts and broken relationships. It is so important for our Savior that He said in the Sermon on the Mount that when you do the most important thing in this life, you're bringing your sacrifice to God and you're worshiping God. You're in the temple of God. You're in the, in the church. You're warming the pews of a church. If you remember that there is someone you have to reconcile with, leave your worship service, leave the most important thing in this life, and run and reconcile with your brother. That previous night, as Jake was wrestling with God, and God was wrestling with Jake, the angel of the Lord was also wrestling, only God can do these things, at the same time with his brother Esau, trying to convince him to let go of his bitterness and of his murderous intent. And you'll say, oh, you just made this up. The Bible does not say it. The Bible says that God was wrestling with Jacob. He was not wrestling with Esau. Did you just read this text that I'm reading on the screen? Did you notice these underlined words, verbs? Let me show you something. How many of you have heard of the parable of the prodigal son? Okay, some of you have heard here. Okay. In the parable of the prodigal son, who is the father? Who, he, who does he represent? God. Let me show you something. In the parable of the prodigal uh, father, or the prodigal son father, okay, when the son comes home, do you notice what the father does? The Bible tells us the father ran. The, the Bible tells us he fell on the neck of his son and he did what also? Kissed him. Esau acts like God the Father. Esau, burly, hairy, scary guy, does not act like himself. That night, God was wrestling with the burly fellow. And this is the third price tag of true reconciliation. Reconciliation with others is impossible without the mediation of God and reconciliation with God first. 
Jacob reconciled with God before he reconciled with his brother. Jacob's reconciliation with God preceded the reconciliation with Esau. And I would like to tell you that many of us cannot reconcile with other people because we have never reconciled with God. I'm sorry to disappoint you and to put into question your Christianity. But I will be not faithful to this passage if I don't tell you that. Only those who have met God first and have reconciled with Him can reconcile with their fellow men and women. And before some of you run to me and tell me, but brother, you absolutely have, have no idea what she did to me or what he did to me. This is unforgivable. I would like to tell you that I don't know what you have been through and what are your disappointments. And I do not expect you to let completely in the person back into your life that has betrayed you. Trust is earned, not deserved. Because the story tells us that after Jake and Esau reconciled, they, and Esau offered the uh, courtesy of uh, accompanying uh, Jake and all that, Jake did not accept that. You don't have to let the person who has hurt you completely back into your life. But you have to ask God to give you the strength to reconcile with God and to reconcile with the people around you. And finally, I would like us to read the last passage for today. I would like to invite someone with a loud preaching voice to read verses 8 through 11. And we're going to discover the last price tag. Before we conclude this service. And it said, What meanest thou by all this drove which I met? And he said, These are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. And Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep that thou hast unto thyself. And Jacob said, Nay, I pray thee, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my present at my hand. For therefore I have seen thy face, as though I had seen the face of God, and thou wast pleased with me. Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because God hath dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. And he urged him, and he took it. Thank you, David. I've seen your face as if I have seen the face of whom? Of God. How can, how can Jake say that? Was he just buttering up his brother? No. Actually, I can show you, but we don't have time. Hints in the, in the narrative that indicate that this is a theophany, a revelation of God. That God was there through Esau. And Jake was not faking it. God really transformed for that moment Esau's heart. And he was acting like God. Here is the last thing that uh, Jacob did in reconciling with his brother. He offered a financial restitution. And actually a quite substantial one. All these droves, five droves of animals that uh, Jake sent ahead of him. Total of 580 animals. Cost, arm and a leg. If we have to convert it into this currency, it's millions of dollars. And the fact that Esau accepted the gift and did not reciprocate it, did not return another gift, 
indicates that this was not an exchange of uh, Middle Eastern courtesy. It means that Esau accepted this as a restitution, that the old score was finally settled. So here's what I would like to share with you last. Reconciliation sometimes will cost you financially too. And I know when you touch the pocket nerve or the wallet nerve of people, this is the most sensitive nerve in the human system. I don't know if you, if you knew that, Dr. Tord. This is the most sensitive nerve in the human system, the pocket nerve. And I know when it comes to money, we are very sensitive. But I would like to tell you, reconciliation is co going to cost you sometimes financially too. Don't be afraid to pay the price. It is worth every penny. And I was reminded of that when I was uh, looking through the old documents and papers uh, in the home of my mom after her, her passing away. And I found old currency, money that was substantial back in the day. And I looked at them, and they were just a piece of paper that meant nothing today. I cannot go with this old money to the bank with this old piece of paper and cash it. It means nothing. And one day, looking from the vantage point of heaven, you and I are going to understand that the price we were reluctant to pay was just paper. Because the currency of heaven are people and human relationships. Let nothing stop you from reconciling with the people that God has put on the crossroads of your lives. Making things right and affecting reconciliation had become spiritual necessity for Jacob. He couldn't put it off anymore. 20 years was enough. And I would like to ask you, is reconciliation with the people in your life become paramount? A spiritual necessity? Do you know why Jacob saw it this way? Because Jacob came to understand that the love of God, his love for God, and his love for his brother are dependent on each other. Dare I say that we love God only as much as we love those we refuse to reconcile with. I would like to invite you to take out of your bulletin this yellow connection card. And I have a few suggestions. You, you are more than welcome to put your suggestion or to, to make your own decision what you're going to do with this sermon and the Word of God. But I have a few suggestions for you. And I would like you to take uh, <clears throat> the yellow connection card. I hope you put your name on the front and turn it to the back. And here are the three steps I would like to suggest. First, I will humble myself so that the Lord can heal my heart and mend my broken relationships. Second, I know that forgiveness and reconciliation will cost me. But like my Savior, I am willing to pay the price in order to live in peace with God and his people. And last but not least, Lord, I have a relationship that desperately needs mending. Would you step in and start the miracle of healing? May God bless us all in our decision making.
Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. Thank you, Pastor, for those words this morning. Those um, commitment steps today on that yellow connection card seem to me to be a little bit more challenging this week than some weeks. It is very difficult to find reconciliation sometimes. But those words, I know, are words we need to hear. At this time, as the deacons come forward, I uh, want to uh, take a quick second to update you on a few things to the church in terms of our finances. I know you've heard lots of things recently about the finances of our local church budget. I want you all to know a couple of things. First, um, last week I gave an offering call for first service, and I started it with a question. I said, have you noticed in the last year and a half anything different about the Worthington Seventh-day Adventist Church and its programming? Have you noticed the increase in Vacation Bible School by droves and droves of students? Have you noticed the difference in the quality at Children's Church? And in the way ministries, the walk ministries, those connections between the academy and the school, the daycare, and the church. If you have noticed some of those things and said, wow, that was a very impressive professionally done VBS program, I want you to know that our church has invested time, energy, and money into making our programming the best it can possibly be. And invite members of our community to our church to be able to participate in these activities. But in order to sustain this, we have to be able to contribute more to our local church funds. Now, I want to tell you all thank you this morning from the church board, which I happen to serve on and as an elder here. Thank you for responding to the call. Our tithe is up. Our local church budget giving is up over last year. That's a a miracle. That's amazing that, that we have reached down and been able to increase our giving over last year. But if you really believe in some of the things that the Worthington Church does and stands for, Please consider showing that by, by considering a special contribution this fall to either the local church budget directly or to our Christmas club. Both of those funds go to fund the things that, we, that run our church, and I won't take the time to go through all those things now. But it was mentioned last week that it might be nice every now and then to hear what, that, what those monies go toward. On your envelope, that line that says local church budget that pays for things like the electricity, the electricity bill that we get every month. Um, for, here's another example. Um, our Sabbath school materials that we use for the kids and for the adults for all of our quarterlies and Sabbath school uh, lessons, out of, of a church of our size over the course of 12 months, it can cost $10,000 just to buy Sabbath school materials for a church of this size. So that gives you an idea of how our church budget can be much larger than some people would imagine it being. It's actually hundreds of thousands of dollars. So we're a little bit off our giving for the year right now. Typically we are this time of year, but this year we are farther than behind now than we usually are. I would pray that you would consider a special gift to the local church budget this fall to help us catch up and support the kind of programs that you've seen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if we don't get there, brothers and sisters, that's fine. The church, we, I want to tell you right now that our church leadership is aware. We, I want you to all be assured we have plenty of money in the bank, but it does mean we won't be able to provide this level of service going forward. So if it means something to you, if you've noticed a difference, please consider a special gift to help say, I believe in the ministries of the Worthington Seventh-day Adventist Church, and I want to see them continue. Uh, Let's bow our heads, and we'll have a quick word of prayer to bless bless our offerings. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this church. Thank you for the message of grace, forgiveness, and love that you've given us to share. I pray, Lord, that you would bless our leaders and bless our parishioners, Lord. I pray that you would touch all of our hearts and that you would help us give as we are able. I pray that not that we would be able to receive more, uh, more money from individuals, Lord, but rather that you would help more and more people within our congregation contribute to the uh, efforts of the, of the local church budget, Lord, so that all of us that come together and are a part of this community contribute in some way to the, uh, to the local church budget, Lord. I pray that you would uh, continue to bless these funds. May they multiply and be used in your service. Please bless the leaders who uh, make decisions about these funds and that they would be used to further your work, Lord. May we continue here to be, have a bold ministry and touch those around us and spread the, the message of your love and forgiveness until the day you come to take us home. Amen.
our closing hymn, hymn 567, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Stand with me, please. Everyone with me. Have thine own way. you from stumbling and to present you faultless before his presence in glory and in exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forevermore amen